Okay, so here we go. So what comes before? We're looking at needlework, but um, and thanks to Pat Grapp and her daughter Helen Grapp Graff, and embroiderers and other donors, embroiderers like Linda Fisher, who's in the room. If you don't know her, she's going to raise her hand for you. Um, we have a lot of her early, her work before the quilts was embroidery, and some of her master classes. Um, the results of that are on the wall in the room next door. But it's interesting because needlework is clearly still very popular. I love this picture of um, the family of the uh, of William and Catherine of, of Cambridge. I believe I have it right. Um, but look at Charlotte's sweater. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a cute little um, Charlotte in her, her little sweater. Um, and there's one of our pieces that's on exhibit. Actually, this is a piece that A, that big A there, the way it's worked, is an indication that it's from Scotland. So another interesting example compared, oh, I want to show you these. If you think that needlework is only done by old women with white hair, um, it's not true. Here are young ladies from the Royal School of Needlework recent pictures, um, and I love their work. Is that not smashing? Is that fun? Here's another example of their work. So those of you that are new to our group might not know that we sometimes compare what we have with what someone else has, and that's what we're going to do with this. These are two chatelines, which are probably my favorite of the objects. Chatelines are my favorite of the objects that are next door. Um, these are beautifully worked, as you can see, one on the left with Mother of Pearl, one on the right with the gilt on it. Um, they're clip style. Um, but let's look at a chatelaine that um, Catherine of Russia had, had commissioned. A little different material, huh? The, um, this is in Hillwood's collection, as it says up there. And I'm going to show you the cipher that's on her um, a little bit more clearly. The detail of this watch that she had commissioned on her chatelaine, which hung from her waist. Um, and here's an example of how it compares to the royal crest as seen on dinnerware at the same time. Kind of a fun thing to see and to compare. I didn't know that other people were using chatelaine. It came down through um, her family, um, and it was bought by um, Marjorie Merriweather Post, who remodeled Hillwood. She's also the woman who owned mar -Longo before it was sold more recently to someone who ran our country. Um, but um, she has created a wonderful place at Hillwood. If you have a chance to go in Washington to see her place, it's really wonderful, and they do some nice things online. I also love this beautiful front cover from Needlecraft Magazine, just reminding us of, look at the date on that. Isn't it fun to think about what life was like in April of 1929? There was no crash. The Spanish flu was over. Life was pretty nice. Um, simpler then, perhaps. So I want to look at some of our early pieces that are in the exhibition. This is, um, this is a stump work embroidered scene featuring a royal figure who is probably King Solomon receiving the Queen of Sheba, and the building in the background is set with mica um, to represent the windows there, and the date on this is circa 1640. Um, another piece in our collection that's early is this embroidery, um, which was probably a seat cushion at one point. It's been worked with silk and metal thread, and was probably for like a large window seat at the time it was made. We think it's a circa 1590 piece, also from Pat Grapp. I'm sorry, there's sort of a ringing. Is anyone hearing that besides me? I don't know what to do about that. Maybe if I move that further away. Um, so then what comes before that? Well, I spent a lot of time on when we were home without students around, looking at this book called Tudor Textiles. Don't you just love the cover? I think I bought it because I wanted the cover. Um, image. And it was written by a woman who regularly works with early pieces in collections in England. Um, and so how were textiles used before the pieces that we have here is something I thought was interesting. Well, Henry VII, that's the father of Henry VIII with all the wives, Henry VII used textiles with heraldic emblems on them to establish the legitimacy of his reign. His son, Henry VIII, enlarged on the use of textiles to demonstrate his power. Remember, they were woven by hand. They were not woven in huge mills in China and Japan. They were woven by hand by craftsmen in Europe and India at the time that they were there. Well, probably, probably not India yet to England, but when Elizabeth comes around, maybe. 
And then when Elizabeth I came along, his daughter, she was largely constrained in purchasing more tapestries because of her father's expenditures. So she did not have the money to do what he did. So what did she do? She went small. Instead of the huge fabrics that covered huge tents, she went with smaller embroideries that were then cut off of canvas, called slips, and put onto other pieces. She also, as every good gentlewoman would do, was an embroiderer. So here is the cover of what was called the Mirror of Glass of the Sinful Soul. It was done in gold and silver thread on blue silk ground. It was worked by Elizabeth when she was a princess, not the queen. And it was given as a gift to her stepmother, Queen Catherine Parr, in 1544. Kind of fun, isn't it, to think that she held that? The following year, she did another one also for Catherine Parr. And um, this was done in 1545, and it was for her meditations, or prayers or meditations, and translated by Elizabeth into Latin, French, and Italian. Kind of fun to think that these survive in the British Museum. Is that ringing any better? It's, is it still problematic? Would you rather, I, it's not problematic, okay, so I don't need to turn off the microphone, okay. Not to be outdone, of course, are the Scots. And here's Mary, Queen of Scots, and something that she made in 1569 to 1584. It's silk on canvas, and it shows an interlaced monogram with the Lily of France, which of course is where she came, she spent so much of her time, and the Thistle of Scotland, which of course was where she came to reign, and the royal crown above that. An unknown artist painted this picture of Queen Elizabeth I. It's called the Rainbow Portrait, it was done about 1600, and it has lots of emblematic imagery in it that would have been meaningful to the Tudor observer. We have imagery that's meaningful to us, things that they had we don't always remember unless a historian helps us figure that out. So the rainbow in her queen in her hand represents a celestial. Her gown features eyes and ears to show that she sees and hears all. Wouldn't that be awful if your mother had that? Your school teacher or your professor, and right, mm -hmm. just a little shit in your head. And then the serpent on her sleeve, which I don't know that I'd want a serpent, but it represents intelligence. Isn't it fun to have that translated? So then here's some examples of where they were getting their ideas for their embroidery. This came out of a book from 1586. It's um, hand-colored wood cut on paper. On the right, on the image on the left, on the right is the cornflower. I'm sorry, I said the wrong. On the left is the cornflower. And on the white and right is the sweet briar. And then the cornflower is blown up for you on the image on the, um, on the right there. So slips are motifs that are embroidered onto small pieces of canvas and then cut out and applied to another fabric. So in the 16th century, the motifs were often floral or botanical, and the technique allowed ladies to work with small frames on their laps, and then the slips could be reapplied and repurposed. So that was what they were doing. Here's an example of a cushion cover that um, is from the late 16th century with many of those slips on it. Here's a detail of that. This picture is a procession portrait of Elizabeth, and it shows um, the canopy over her chair is decorated with embroidered slips. This is a um, this is a silk coverlet which was embroidered with silver on it. And then here's some images of a woman of women actually doing needlework. So you see the ladies that are seated. Or there's a weaving bob and lace. They're weaving bob and lace on the left. They're embroidering in the center. And they're sewing lace on the right. Here's a little detail of those ladies. I'll flip through this a little more quickly. And here the ladies are shown weaving and working embroidery. Um, and this was very much the pursuit of young noble women. This is a sampler worked in 1598, and it's the earliest dated British sampler. It records the birth of a child. And as we all know, these were reference pieces for women and, and inexperienced embroider and experienced embroiderers. This is a valance that hung um, at the time that Henry and Anne Boleyn were together. So you can see the HA 
there on the in the corners, in the upper corners for Henry and Anne. Another piece probably done in the 1560s, which was an allegory talking about stories, um, mythical stories. Here is that image that was on the cover. And um, these are flowers, fruits, and insects. They were favored as embroidery motifs during this period. And they were really not stylized as much as they were. This is exactly what it looks like. Because all of the books that were out about, about flowers and botany and insects that you could actually use as your samples. This is a cushion embroidered with lots of flowers, but all done in this in this in the metal, uh, in the metallic thread. This is um, this was used to carry the great seal of England, kind of a fancy, lovely, beautiful bag. This piece from 1540 shows an insect and an owl and roses. Think these are designs that were very popular at the time. This piece comes from Italy. This predates what we're using in our collection. And then many of the beautiful pieces that we see were done by men who were professionals. So it wasn't something they were doing at night while they watched television, obviously. It wasn't something that they did in their spare hours, unless they were women who were of means. But they were also done by professionals, as we can see from this image. This is a beautifully embroidered piece um, out, of the, out of a workshop of about 1,500 in Flanders. And then remember I was mentioning the embroideries were based on original designs. Well, here are some of the botanical books that are coming out at the time that they can then copy. You can see the, draw, the book on the left and how the images were drawn onto canvas for someone to embroider on the right. I think it helps to put in context what you're seeing next door with what happened before. And that's why I wanted to show you these pieces. And of course, I could not let it go by without highlighting the elephant, my favorite motif. I don't know if I've told the story of why, but someday I will, not today, we don't have time for that. Um, this woman is wearing a skirt that has been extensively embroidered. So that's how it was used. And then nodding shuttles. You know, we have a whole section of nodding shuttles next door, which were used to make little strings of knots that look like pearls that you would use to enhance your embroidery, give it three-dimensional. This is a portrait of a woman using a nodding shuttle. And, uh, Here's what they look like next door. Can you see how fat they are compared to tatting shawls? They're bigger and they're fatter. And that's one way we know the difference. Most of them don't survive because, well, why? Why don't they survive? Well, they don't survive because of a thing called the French Revolution, when suddenly no one was going to wear embroidered clothing because we needed to look like we didn't have a lot of money to keep our necks attached to our heads. And so that's why they went out of fashion and people didn't continue to use them. And that's why people sometimes go, well, that's a tanning shuttle. No, it's a knotting shuttle. And we don't use them. We didn't use them ever here in Lubbock. But they did use them at Colonial Williamsburg, I think, because of the time period. OK, so let's see what else is up here. Oh, right, OK, so here's the good news. This is about Laura Johnson. This is one of the pieces she's going to show us from Winterthur. And there is the magic number to RSVP. We need to, and it will be on the next screen too. We need to RSVP by November the 11th. So it's one week in advance of the event so that Joanna can order the food. Okay, I'm going to switch to the next slide so people can look at the picture. The same number is on this slide if you want it. But you don't have to worry because if you got an email from me about today, you'll get that phone number in an email. So don't, don't rush to write it down if you don't want to, okay? All right, we're going to move on and talk about, oh, an evening with Linda Fisher. That will happen in this room on Thursday, January 13th. Again, at 5.30 to 8.30, there will be food, there will be an RSVP required, and you will get a reminder about that right around Christmas. Sorry it will happen when you're really busy, but that's I have to hold off on some of these until Joanna's ready to take the reservation, if that makes any sense. 
And if you haven't seen the beautiful exhibit outside, um, 73 pieces by one person, a huge thing to have in any museum, that many pieces by one person. A great opportunity for future scholars to study what was happening here in, in West Texas um, at the end of the 20th and beginning of the 21st century by a very prolific person who was not only a prolific culture but also a teacher, a very gracious and loving person that lots of people like in the community. Um, and then she, she's so fast that she made another 50 that are going to go on auction in February. And there will be a live auction and there will be an online auction and we will share those details. And so here's the deal. All of that money goes into the endowment for the position for whoever comes after me. And so that they have to hire somebody. As we all know with women's things, they don't always hire someone after someone retires. And so this, the whole idea is that the money that you would spend on whatever quilt you, it's like a donation to the museum and you get a quilt as a door prize, is how you really need to think about it. So save your pennies, please. And we'll tell you more about that in a bit. Okay, so Louise Hopkins Underwood, she's a very interesting woman and her family in getting ready for this exhibit, we said to them, you know, it would be helpful if we had pictures of her in the dresses that we have that we're going to show in the exhibit. Well, we got pictures. And you're going to get treated to them because they will not be in the exhibit because there's just not room for all of them. So here is um, Louise Underwood in her life from beginning to end. Some pictures of young Louise. There, I think, with a doll on the right. I think she's the child on the right in this picture. I know that the, one of the reasons that we're videotaping today is so that the family who could not be in the room can have a chance to see it. So if I've made a mistake, I'm sure they'll help me correct that and I apologize in advance. Some pictures of her with her family. I think that's her there on the left. Then as she grows up, she attended Hockaday School in Dallas. Any of you that know anything about education in Dallas, and Miss Hockaday and her school know that it is the top girl school in Dallas. In, and and um, it is just where every parent wants to get their child to go if they can afford the tuition because of the connections and the education. So Louise um, was a debutante. And this picture was in the Dallas Morning News in December 31st of 1939. The text is there on the right, and you really need to hear this. And my husband will laugh hysterically when he hears it on Saturday, but I'm, I think you'll hear it and enjoy it too. Unrestrained hilarity was the keynote of the fast-moving presidential dinner party given by host Samuel Pace Johnson immediately before the 26th annual ball. It's one of the debutante balls during the season between Christmas and New Year's when the, when the ladies are home from school. Um, as the cast country kids played the coming out song chosen for each debutante's debut earlier this year at the Idlewild, loud cheers and applause sounded. Here, unofficial Deb, Louise Hopkins, you can see her leaning forward there, rises to, I didn't know what time it was, play because of her particular penchant for being late for dates. That was kind of fun. I never knew that about her. I'm sure that's why I liked her so much. Um, here she is again, and here she is on the, I think that's one of the earliest pictures of her with her husband and then her fiancé, Harris Underwood. At one point, Harris wasn't in town, so she went to the ice show with Edwin Marcus, with Edward Marcus, I'm sorry, the brother of Stanley Marcus, as in Neiman Marcus, um, which was probably one of the reasons that many dresses came from Neiman Marcus. And this was her wedding announcement, um, Miss Louise Longcope Hopkins, attractive daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Edwin B. Hopkins, became the bride of Mr. Harris Underwood of Lubbock and Athens on October the 11th, probably 1941. Miss Hopkins was extensively entertained prior to her marriage. Love those things, don't you? So her early life was a lot about parties. See her in the back there. I love, I love this picture of this. On the left, it's the background of the Travoli Fountain in Rome. Her daughter was like, oh yeah, they took a trip to Rome. I was like, no, Glenn, that's a painting because it doesn't look like that anymore. It probably didn't look like that then. But what I love about this picture is that Louise is sitting on some man's lap. You know, the life of the party, I think, in lots of places. And there she is with Harris, I think, in the picture on the right. Here she is again, I think I pointed her out. 
This was taken at the Fountain Lounge in the Roosevelt Hotel um, in New Orleans and came with its own little special folder from that place. Here she is on board the Queen Mary. And then it's time to settle down in Lubbock. So here she is on the right holding Jane, her firstborn, who is, has been very instrumental in lots of the things that we've been able to borrow and use for this exhibit. Here she is at Creed, Colorado um, with her husband, Harris. And here she is with all of her children on the left and Harris. Now, so Louise is the fourth from the left. The woman to the, on the other side of Harris is Jane, their oldest daughter. And then there is Buster, the twins, and then the youngest child. And we'll talk more about them in a second, like right here, I think. This is from the Olympic Avalanche Journal in 1959. Um, and the text says, favorite eating area. The patio at the home of Mr. and Mrs. Harris Underwood is the setting for many meals during the summertime. The grill, cabinets, and sink are built against the exterior brick wall. Underwood is, ch is chef for preparation of steaks, with the entire family assisting in preparing the meal. Ready for serving from the grill are left to right, Jane, 16, Busty, Busty, that's really what they call it, B-U-S-T-Y, they still call him Busty, um, 13, David and Amy, twins, six. I think David died, and so I'm not sure all the circumstances I'm seeing people shaking their heads. That was before I arrived here. Um, but Amy is still alive, as is Mary, who was two and a half in this picture. Mrs. Underwood, um, and then Mr. Underwood. Not pictured is a daughter, Gwen, 12, who is at Camp Waldemere, which is where they all went for their summer camp. Mrs. Underwood finds the sink area an excellent place for making flower arrangements. Don't you just love the newspapers from the 50s? They're kind of fun. Jane was very specific about making sure I showed you this picture. The children are playing in the backyard, and on the jungle gym are Louise's dresses hanging out to air. I thought it was kind of a fun thing. Very good better picture there. It must have been a raucous time. Okay, so the first piece we're going to talk about today is her Seal Chapman gown, which is all the way on the right here. It was designed by Seal Chapman, who was a very important designer in the 40s and 50s and into the very beginning of the 60s, and we'll see lots of her designs in a minute. But we use, um, as you can imagine from the pictures she see, you've seen of her, was not the typical debutante. She wasn't real interested in getting her portrait painted, but her mother insisted, you need to get your portrait painted, and we're gonna get you this dress by Seal Chapman from Nina Marcus. And so she sat for it, and she said later to me, she said, you know, I really had a good time with that, with that artist. I really enjoyed it a lot more than I thought it was going, that I was going to enjoy it. The girls talked about this being right after the time the busty was born, so she still looked pretty good after three children, I think. Um, let's talk about Seal Chapman, and then we'll look at the dress more carefully. Okay. So who's Seal Chapman? Well, she was really an important woman, woman's designer. She was one of those American fashion designers who was just at the right age when World War II hit, and we couldn't get designs from Paris any longer, that her career was really put forward because we were relying on American designers then, since we couldn't get Paris clothes. She really had um, a distinctive niche with party dresses and party clothes. And for more than a decade, a Chapman dress was synonymous with debutante parties and senior proms. Um, she had quite a life in New York, knew a lot of the theater people. Because she knew the theater people, they started to wear her clothes, and that helped with her popularity. They called her dresses tabletop dresses because if you sat at the tabletop in a nightclub, you still had this great decliche, kind of showing off um, your features. And so that's one of the reasons that they showed that, 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 that she was so popular. Here she is. This is the dress that she made for Elizabeth Taylor when she married Nikki Hilton on, in 1950. And she's also then shown there with Debbie Reynolds. So she had interactions with people in Hollywood, probably because she had interactions with them when they were in New York on stage and then carried on into, into Hollywood. Here's a beautiful gown by, um, that she did, photographed by Horst. Here she is with a mother and daughter working on ensembles probably for both for special events. Another picture of Seal. Here she is with her models. She's standing there on the left and the models are all in her designs in her studio. And a few more Seal Chapman designs. 
And so, as you know, with come and see, there's always an overlap. We start over here, we end up talking about over here. So you're getting a preview of Miss America. Miss America fashion is going to be 30 plus garments worn by women who are Miss America. Everyone from Miriam Bergeron, whose cape, which was made for her by the women of Atlantic City, her coronation robe from 1933, will be on exhibit straight through to Kelly Cash's super suit swimsuit that she wore during Miss America in 1987. Um, Shirley Cawthorn Barrett, Miss Texas, and then Miss America 1975, met me in a bank parking lot to hand over her competition evening gown and swimsuit. So that will be in the exhibit, as will lots of other really interesting things. Unfortunately, this dress will not be in it, but on here's a picture from the pageant in 1949. On the far right is Miss Alabama, and there's a little detail of Yulon Betby, and she wore a seal chapman gown in this picture. And there was quite a brouhaha that this was supposed to be on the cover of a magazine at that time. And in fact, here's the ad from right about the same time for probably the same dress. So one of the Miss Americas, actually two of them, competed excuse me, in Seal Chapman gowns. Then here is a um, very important picture of Lee Merriweather. This is the first time a Miss America is shown with their iconic crown that we come to know as the Miss America crown. And this is in the pageant book from 1955. She's featured and they discuss the dress, which we happen to have downstairs. It has been loaned to us by an anonymous donor that Lee trusted the dress to, <laughs> saying to that donor, that anonymous lender, uh, well, I'm gonna have to, have to pay you for conservation work on it. Well, we've done a lot of conservation work on it because apparently many people wore this dress. Unfortunately, there's no label that says it's by Seal Chapman, but the book in which Lee is featured with all the, it's the pageant program book they do every year, and her pageant program book, <laughs> she's in this, this is her picture from that with that crown, and it says that it's a Seal Chapman dress made of Everglaze fabric. Everglaze was made by Joseph Bancroft and Sons of Delaware, and they were huge sponsors of the pageant, very important sponsors of the pageant, and their fabrics were then made up by major designers for the women who were Miss America as their official wardrobe or for other purposes, and this is, this is one that was done, and it was by Seal Chapman. And here's that dress, we've worked on it. It'll be, when Sloan gets done with it, it'll look even better because she's gonna pat it out and make it look more like Lee did the day that she wore it. And here is Lee with the person she crowned next, Sharon Ritchie of Colorado. And Lee's wearing that dress. And what's also important about this is this was the first night that Birth Parks ever sang, There She Is Miss America, 200 Miss America. So this dress is really very iconic. And unfortunately, it was used for dress up by these children way too much, I think. But now it's back and they, uh, they probably won't do that again. So here um, is another Everglaze ad with Nancy Fleming from 1961. And on the right is a Seal Chapman gown. So they had major designers do dresses and so Seal was one that was so selected. And then Jacqueline Mayer out of Ohio chose a Seal Chapman gown when she was competing as Miss Ohio and became Miss America in 1963. So they're sort of where Seal kind of goes, lots of different places. So another dress that's up here is by Sybil Conley, and we're going to show this one. We will go to this one next as soon as I talk about her. Sybil Conley was, um, here's Mrs. Underwood wearing it. So here's the second dress that we have where she actually is wearing the garment that you're seeing here. There she is on the left of your screen at the 1962 Peppermint Stick Golf Tournament. Um, and it was designed by Seal Connolly, who was uh, born in 21 and died in 98. She was a Dublin-based fashion designer who was known for making fashion from Irish fabrics, particularly Irish linen that she pleated very finely. And she was called a national treasure by one of the prime ministers of Ireland. Um, she did a lot of fittings in the royal family. In fact, was there, um, it says Queen Mary. She worked for a company that did dresses for Queen Mary, was the grandmother of the current queen. And she, she wasn't doing a lot but holding the pins during fittings, but still she was in the room. And she was really known in the 50s for her work. And, oh, there we go, there we are. One of her most important dresses was the one that Jackie Kennedy wore for her official portrait, which still hangs in the White House. So let's um, switch now, Scott, from, um, PowerPoint to the video camera, and Sloan's going to get up, turn it on, and we're going to go look at 
things on the stage for a minute. So I want to start by showing them the beautiful embroidery that is on the seal chapman gown. And you'll have to forgive us. We, um, when we pulled the dresses up yesterday, we saw some things we want to fix. So this will be steamed out before it goes on exhibition. But can you show them this wonderful embroidery on this? Okay, I'll stop and hold. Okay, I'll go down the side then. Stop and hold. Good, and then show the decoche. How it's finished there. Beautiful piece, and the students have enjoyed putting it together. I showed them the Sybil Connolly. This is actually a jacket, careful, over a dress, and with a little bow on it. And it really feels like pleated silk. It's, um, Sybil was known for her pleated um, linen, but I'm really feeling like this is silk. And then while you're here, show them the bill blast, the detail here on the side. This is um, the mint green is a bill blast. And then let's show them the fabric on the Mountain Star. Show them the collar. And then go down the arm. So. And then show them the ape shredder. And this one is a um, beautiful brocade uh, ensemble with a, a dress underneath and with these wonderful rhinestone buttons. That our closures. There, there you go. Stop. Okay. Okay. Go and have a seat. And we'll show them the other side in a minute. I have so much to show you today that I am kind of rushing to make sure we get through everything. Because I'm very conscious of the time. Now that Scott has sat down back there, I can really see the clock, which is great. Um, you're back on the screen for me. Thank you. So Mrs. Underwood is pictured here with her mother during an exhibit of her mother's, of her grandmother, her mother's, grandmother, her mother Hopkins, um, Sorry's. And there's Mother Hopkins in the middle for a birthday party. Louise loved to entertain in long lounge dresses. Unfortunately, we didn't choose any of those for the exhibition because it was a competition and we could only put in 25, 27 dresses. So you really had to the dress had to really step forward and be the dress, or it wouldn't be in the exhibit. And the other part of this is that we really wanted to show Louise as a change agent for her community. And although I know she did some change work when she was wearing her lounge long dresses at her parties, and um, when she was attending formal events, she did a lot of it at meetings, and so we really felt it was more the day wear that we wanted to show you in this exhibition. So they had a really interesting family life. I love this picture. You might say, why is Harris in his bathrobe? Well, it's because the kids had mounted a surprise party for them. And they, um, they launched it on them just as, the, as Louise and Harris were getting ready to go out to dinner to celebrate their 25th wedding anniversary. So that's why Harris is in his, his uh, bathrobe. Fortunately, he had a bathrobe on. I guess we should be glad about that. <sighs> They traveled a great deal. Here they are at Camp Waldemere on the left, and on the right, they're at Stonehenge with the Bobby Lane. So Bobby Lane, some of you know as the big important football player out of the University of Texas, but then he also played for the Detroit Lions, was their most important quarterback for years. Um, and Carol Kruger Lane, his wife, was a close friend of Louise's. Carol was a socialite. Her father, um, Dr. Kruger, was very important here in Lubbock, and they were part of the scene that the, the Underwoods were in. Louise loved traveling. Here she is with her daughter, Jane, on the left, and then Jane's in the picture on the right as well when Louise is getting ready to board the train to Houston to go to Europe in the spring of 68. Here she is with Harris, I think in England, but I'm not positive. And there she is in a picture that appeared um, on February 23rd in 1969, I believe in the Lubbock Avalanche Journal. One of the pieces, oh, right. And here's Louise dancing with her son-in-law, Jack. We have that dress in the museum collection. That's how I was able to date this picture. I knew it was Jack, I knew it was Louise, but I wasn't really sure that he was actually the bridegroom in this, in this, at this event. 
but we have both her dress, this one that she wore, and as well as the shoes and I think the hat, and um, also her daughter Jane's wedding dress from that same day. So we do have a lovely encyclopedia downstairs of her things. This piece um, I wanted to show you, it's in the exhibition. Seal Chapman, for a period of time after she closed her shop, worked for Samuel Winston, who in 1974 designed this green ombre silk and wool ensemble for the firm Roxanne, which was a division of Charles James. So this is sort of another piece that happens with Seal Chapman. We did not bring that up for you to see today because as you can see, the stage is very crowded. And so we had to pick and choose what we would show you today. The next piece that I want to show, talk about is that beautiful mint green Bill Blass dress, which has that fun chain going on, on on the right. Bill Blass was widely considered one of the most charismatic and generous men in the profession, and one whose social and business skills mingled so adeptly that, his, that he was once described as being able to charm the clothes right onto a woman's back. He was a gentleman of American fashion, and he had a sense of being very American, but very fun and glamorous to be with. He traveled in interesting circles, including here with Henry and Nancy Kissinger in 1987, when Kissinger and Nancy were still very popular and moving in important circles. And he was one of those designers who became part of the world of the women who wore his clothes. A few of them did. Jeffrey Bean, who we're going to see in a minute, did as well. Because of the recent book by Anderson Cooper, we have a few references to um, Gloria Vandergrilt here, and here she is with Bill Blass. He was born in Fort Wayne, loved glamour, and got out as soon as he could um, to get into New York and other places where he could do his design work. He actually won a design prize sponsored by the Chicago Tribune that then set him on his way. Here he is in his office, and then with um, Jacqueline Smith a little later, and he, he served time in the army. He was part of the um, camouflage group that inflated tanks to deceive the um, enemy, the Germans, during, the, during World War II. When he came back to New York, he still didn't have his real firm yet. He, um, he joined Anne Klein as an assistant, but he was soon dismissed. She said, I had good manners, but no talent. <laughs> and then we multiplied and made that talent, certainly turned into wonderful and wonderful millions of dollars. His designs gradually became recognized, and he actually went to work for a woman named Anne Miller. When Anna Miller retired, her business was merged with that of her brother, Maurice Rechner, which was a well-regarded fashion house in New York City. And he, so he went to work for Maurice Renter. Eventually, he died, Renter died, Rentner died in 1960, and that was when Blast got his name on the label to start with. Here are some of the examples of his pieces. And um, what I thought was kind of interesting, we have this piece by Rangi. Remember what it looks like, because here's a piece from Rentner that's in the costume collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, probably designed by Bill Platts. I kind of found that we have a piece that was inspired, perhaps, by that. Okay, so, uh, ooh, bad picture, sorry about that. But you can see the, the two-piece silver and Brown Ensemble by Abe Schrader. It doesn't seem like a very a name that many people would remember. Here he is. Um, he, lived from, uh, he lived to be over 100, celebrated his 100th birthday at uh, the Plaza Hotel, dancing with Pauline Trigere and Ed Koch, the former mayor, was there. So he was having a grand old time. Um, Schrader was born in Poland to a uh, well-off family, that, uh, and he was um, t inducted into the Polish army for, during World War I put on the German border where he felt like he was treated badly because he was Jewish. And um, he forged papers and got himself released to Germany, an even better place for someone of that heritage, I'm sure. Um, but he came to America and was here in the 1920s. So he got out before the Nazi regime. And he was very instrumental in working with the unions. His best, one of his best friends was the head of the Ladies' Garment Workers Union. And so they negotiated a lot of deals that enabled American fashion in the 70s to continue to be strong in this country without shipping things off to other countries. Um, he was um, very influential at the time, and he was part of, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped that. He was part of getting um, the name Fashion Avenue um, put on the street name there in, in New York City. There he is with um, Mayor John Lindsay. 
Um, and he became active also with, um, he was interested in civil rights, and he was interested in workers' rights, which would surprise you that that would align him with LBJ. And so he became a great friend of LBJ's, and actually he raised money for his campaign. And I think he advised Lady Bird on some of her choices for the inaugural. She, he did not make the gown that she, the yellow gown that we all remember that she wore for the inaugural with a beautiful make trim on the coat. But he advised her at that time, I think. He sold his business in 84 because he was disturbed by the turn of the anti-union sentiment and all of the things being shipped overseas, but he stayed active as an investor in those sorts of things. So here's some of the pictures of his designs. Spare. Notice the length of the skirt in 1975. He was very proud of the fact that they didn't go way up with any of the dresses or way down with any of their dresses, but sort of kept a moderate um, hem length. Here are some, excuse me, some more of their designs featured in ads from places like Ward and Taylor, Jacobson's, uh, Bergdorf Goodman, some other important shops, Bonneville Teller. And here's another of their designs. Very Kind of interesting. Look at that wonderful lining that matches the the uh, the, um, the the bow tie there, and the hat. This is a with his son. It's a video, but I don't think I can run that from here. So that gives you a little more contemporary picture of that gentleman. Um, so now, I'm speaking to Mr. H. Schrader, Chairman of the Trading Corporation, and Sun Washington, the President of Trading Corporation. You have a special woman in mind. Think about the what did you describe her? A very smart lady with money to spend on better clothes. Sort of a complex that would like in mind from medium to high salary, salary lady. Yes, and the, and the Abe Schrader division, for sure. At Schrader, we stood before, for the same kind of clothes we had planned always, uh, when, when length went way up. We may have in this whole cycle change moved an inch or two. Either way, we've never had that uh, jump going way short, way long. We stand for something. And the end result was that the stores in this difficult period did well with Schrader. And there you have it from the gentleman's mouth, directly. Thank you, Scott, for helping me do that. So I want to mention the Malcolm Star that's on the stage. Louise and her husband did cruise. They cruised with the lanes. And at one point, um, Harris decided to take the whole South Plains Cotton Co-op on their annual meeting on a cruise. And here's Louise wearing that Malcolm Star that we saw earlier. There, that's on the stage. Here she's with Harris, and they're meeting the, they're having dinner with the ship's captain. Here's the dress. It's a floor-length dress of um, seafoam green polyester. It's by Malcolm Starr. Um, here's just a, the kids sent, the kids, the daughters, sent me this fun picture of Welcome Harris Underwood, president of Southwest Compress Association. Um, he was involved in lots of important business things, and I think her social acumen certainly helped him in the social settings that they were involved in. A dress that didn't make it into the exhibit in our collection is this Malcolm Pink Malcolm Star. Here, Eloise is wearing it at the Assembly Club. It was probably the debut of one of her daughters, either Mary or Amy, I'm not sure which. Um, didn't make it into the, into the exhibition just because we thought others were stronger, but there she is in it. And then not to be on how done, of course, um, Susan Perkins from Ohio wore a Malcolm Star. Here, this is a lavender Malcolm Star gown um, that she wore on her way to Miss, the title of Miss America 1978. And one of the symbolism pieces there for Susan was the fact that it's a royal purple. You know, sometimes the Miss Americas are able to sort of use the symbols of royal clothing to sort of say, I am a royal, you should crown me kind of thing. And Susan's worked well for her in that dress. Moving on, um, here's Louise, who seemed to favor a lot of sleeveless sheath, sheath dresses. Um, and I think that, let's see, this is not the same dress. I have them mixed up. There's a yellow one that's in the exhibit, which is a clot, if I'm not mistaken. Um, um, but here is um, a teal trina. Of course, teal trina sounds like, it's a woman designer, right? Well, no, actually, teal trina is a man. Um, this is a linen shift, um, and teal trina, um, was a manufacturer. He was not really a designer, but he hired designers to work for him. And one of the designers that he hired was Jeffrey Bean. This is probably, given the date, a Jeffrey Bean design. And Till Trina once said that, well, Bean said about working for Trina, he left me alone and made it possible for me to do my own thing. He had a great sense of humor and I shall ever be indebted to him. Here, uh, I think, is Till Trina. 
He joined his father's and his uncle's business, which was Tra Trina Norell, after World War II, and then he bought it out and became um, Trina, just Teal Trina at that time in the, in the late 50s. Jeffrey Bean was one of the designers. At this time, Trina is really the manufacturer, Bean is the designer, and this is before designers get their names on lots of things. But he was known for discovering young talent for his label. And he once said that over the entrance to his 7th Avenue showroom, it should say school because of all the designers that he sort of trained in the process. Um, but this orange is one of our one of my favorites, and I love the scarf that, that Mrs. Henry loaned us to, to go with that. Lest you think um, the scarf that you see on this, the pearls that you see on the next one, the students have had great fun the past couple of days now that we've accessorized everything, going in with, with thread and stitching the accessories to the mannequin. So, you know, if someone comes to the exhibit and thinks, oh, I'm going to grab those pearls, well, it's going to be a little difficult for them to do that. So, just saying, just thought you'd like to know some of the health sausages made here. Um, so here is Louise and Harris on their 30th, 33rd wedding anniversary. And um, as you can see, the dress is on the screen. It was designed by Jeffrey Bean. And um, she wore it often. She wore it even further into the future. And don't you love what Harris is holding, that great picture of American Gothic there? And in the picture on the right, um, I'm sure that Louise purchased this dress at Margaret's. And Margaret Talkington, who had the boutique, which enabled Louise really to dress well as standing there next to Louise in that picture. When I asked the girls what it was like, her daughters, what it was like going shopping for their clothes with Louise Underwood, they just all like, they went into hysterics. And they were still laughing about it the following weekend um, because they never went shopping with their mother. Mother sent them to Margaret's. Margaret's is the, is the place that brought the dresses in. They tried them on. If they liked them, then they took them across to the shoe part, to the hat part if it was needed. Margaret would bring back dresses from New York shopping excursions and say, I was thinking of you there, and I think this is what you need to wear for your dead ball, or I think this is what you need to wear for that party that's coming up. And these are the stories that I hear from the women that bought at Margaret's. And they just laughed in peals of laughter. That, they, that we would ever think that they would go shopping for clothes with their mother. No, she just sent us to Margaret. So, you know, those of you that were around in the 60s, Louise totally avoided all those fights about miniskirts. Margaret's handled all that. But then also Margaret, they said, you know, mother never went shopping. She just went to Margaret's. And everything was there kind of thing. Louise was in the room when we showed this dress the first time um, at Come and See. And she remembered that she had worn this same dress to the um, party uh, for, um, I'm, I'm getting this wrong, is it on there? Yeah, the party for Jay Lee Johnson III, his 70th birthday party at the Fort Worth Club. And Sarah Vaughn, who's pictured there on the left, was his favorite singer. And of course, she performed in that. Um, and she, they were great friends with the, um, with the Johnsons for a long time in their, in their lives. So here's a picture of Jeffrey Bean, who designed the black and pink dress on the stage. Many times the students, even yesterday, one of the students said, oh yeah, the black and pink coat. No, it's not a coat, it's a dress. But easy mistake to make, because I thought it was a coat at first as well. In fact, I think it was Louise who corrected me, because I wasn't really intimate with, it, with the dress. But it was designed by Jeffrey Bean. There's a little information about him. Born in 27, died in 2004, was another American fashion design, designer who was born in this country. He liked simple, comfortable clothing and dressy women's wear. He was a technician who really understood Parisian dressing and dress design, but also made things comfortable for women. We think one of the <laughs> designs that might have inspired Bean in this dress is this Caporelli coat, which was designed as a ski outfit. Isn't it fun to see the comparisons? Uh, maybe, maybe not. Jeffrey Bean also was known for designing Linda Robb's wedding gown. Um, but he was also criticized because it was very stiff. She wore this in 1967, and by this time, we were getting those pretty chiffon evening gowns. And this was a rather stiff piece, a uh, princess line. Here she is with her dad. Um, and so that encouraged me to start looking for lighter weight clothing to wear. In case you're wondering, the Robs are still married. Kind of, can't you see the look on his face there? He clearly loved her, it seems like, in that picture at least. Good way to tell. And then the same design was recently used um, by Temperley of London for their winter 2015 line. This is a coat that was worn by Catherine, the Duchess of, of Cambridge, but so similar. 
what we have here in the Louise Underwood dress. The next dress on stage is designed by um, Adele Simpson, an American fashion designer. Um, she actually was the fifth daughter of um, immigrants from Latvia. Um, it's interesting, as we're talking about these fashion designers, the number that have been immigrants in some way or another. I think she was born here, but her parents were the immigrants. At 21, she completed her design curriculum at the Pratt Institute in New York, and she took the place of her older sister, Anna, as the head designer for a firm, a prominent 7th seventh, seventh Avenue fashion designer, and worked for them until she was able to go out on her own. And I'm, slow, I'm going through these a little bit quickly because I want to make sure we have time for the other pieces. One of the things that she designed was the yellow ensemble that Lady Bird is wearing here for Lucy's wedding. I'm sorry, I could not, although I searched, I could not find a picture of this in color, so there you have it. And she also designed the um, gown that um, Pat Nixon wore for the second inaugural that Ev Nixon's in 1973, which was right around when Watergate was going on. And he didn't, he didn't last in the office that year. He was gone before the end of the year. Here Adele Simpson is with um, Jack Kelly, who is a Bonwit Teller, um, a uh, department store buyer, looking at uh, Mrs. Bruce Edward Arnold's coat, which was a Simpson design, and there is a Simpson um, um, ad. And then the next pink uh, piece is by Colleen Trigere. Mrs. Underwood had several pieces by Trigere in her collection that she gave to the museum that were purchased at Margaret's. This is one that we chose to show because we felt, because one of them we'd already shown in Ladies in Red, and the other one didn't look as good on the mannequin as it probably looked on her. And um, Pauline Trigere was an important American designer. She said that fashion is what people tell you to wear. Style is what comes from your own inner thing. And Pauline Trigere was um, based in New York. She had many different relationships with lots of, working with lots of different designers over the years and different labels. Um, and she was known, she dressed um, Wallace Simpson, the Duchess of Windsor. She dressed Betty Davis and Lena Horn, in addition to Mrs. Underwood, of course. Here are some of the other uh, pieces by Pauline Trigere. And this is, this is our piece that we're showing you in the exhibit. And then we swiggled in one more piece, which is the Oscar de la Renta, which is all the way on the on New York left. Um, and I think this piece that Mrs. Underwood wore was actually Oscar de la Renta, ready to wear. But um, de la Renta is such an important name. He was born in Santo Domingo. He was, yeah, he was born in Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic. He began his career in Franco, Spain, where he was sketching for the house of Cristobal Balenciaga. His sketches caught the eye of many women, including um, the ambassador, his wife, to Spain, who asked him design, to design her daughter's debutante dress, which appeared on the cover of Life magazine, which was a great way to get launched in the business. He was, I love this story about him. He was hired to be um, an assistant to the head designer at Landvin in, 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 in France. And, and um, De Laurentiis said, he loved me because I spoke Spanish. And he asked if I could cut, drape, and sew. And of course, I said yes. He offered me a little more money than Dior had, then I said I would start in two weeks. Then I went to a fashion school and asked the woman who ran it if she could teach me a year's worth of lessons in two weeks. <laughs> he was very, um, he was one of those great various men who enjoyed being where the action was, whether it was a gala, at the domino's table, or entertaining his the women that he dressed. Many of them, uh, well, four of them were first, la four, were first ladies, Hollywood stars, etc. They would come to his one of his many homes. Once in a speech, he offered to send three-way mirrors to certain fashion editors who wore miniskirts. I thought about that sometimes as I walked the halls watching the students, but, you know, kind of fun. So here's some of his designs. Um, and then one of the most important dresses came to Houston not too long ago, and it was worn by Amal, um, who, as we all know, Amal, Amani Dunn, I, mean, I don't say her name very well, but it's easier to say Clooney, isn't it? I mean, here she is getting fitted for her wedding dress. Um, and here, I can't, you can't do a come and see without some handsome man um, on, the, on the screen. Here she is in her Oscar de la Renta wedding dress on the day of her wedding to Mr. Clooney in Venice, Italy. And so the piece we have is this suit, which was probably ready to wear out of the Oscar de la Renta line. It's still not inexpensive. And here is Louise wearing it. We're having a little discussion about how we're going to accessorize it, because here Louise is in France with her daughters. 
She's reading a French language newspaper. Her daughters report that she told them that the paper said that day that a Van Gogh painting had sold for more money than any other painting ever before. Um, and they were amazed that she could read French in the newspaper. And here she is with that wonderful red kind of um, scarf, but it's a wool scarf that she would have worn because it was cold. You can see from the person in the picture to the right of her that it's cold where they're sitting. So there's been the debate, do we show it with that scarf, which really needs the picture to explain what's going on, or do we show it with a pretty silk black and white scarf that we have on the screen, on the, on the, on the platform? I think we're going to go this way, but you know, we'll see. It, it's still up for debate, I think. She loved to travel, and one of the things she loved was to wear these wonderful Leonard dresses. I think some of you have Leonard dresses or may have seen Leonard dresses. They traveled really well. The one on the left will be in the exhibit. And when she traveled, I love this picture. <laughs> this is the luggage coming out of London with the lanes. <laughs> I'm sure they tip them well, but you know. Um, and then here, Louise is playing around with a pair of shoes that she had worn on all of her European trips. And the back of the picture says, don't you love these old shoes I wore all over Europe? Three trips. This was taken just before our last trip in 1968. And we're working on, on one for April of this year, Ever the Venerate tra tra um, Traveler. So she did buy shoes on her trips. One of her trips to Europe, she was on a cruise, and the Metropolitan Opera had singers that were on the same cruise. And they told her, you have to go to this place in Rome and get your shoes made because they're just so wonderful and comfortable. So here's one of the pair, and here's the other pair of those shoes that she got um, on that trip. So let's go to the, Scott, can we go to the camera, please? And we'll start with the dresses, and then we'll come back to the shoes, okay? And Scott, you might need to turn the lights up for, this, for the um, dresses. Or maybe not, I don't know. I'm sure the crew, the people will weigh in. This is the teal trina. It actually has pockets that work. Nice straight line down the front, probably of a linen fabric or linen blend, I would guess, because it didn't wrinkle on us. And then here's the Jeffrey Bean. See the wonderful stitching on this? Choked out. And then let's look at the um, ruffle of the, you're fine, of the Adele Simpson. Pretty fabric. I'll turn to your left so you can show the yeah. Pauline Trigere. And yes, those pearls are sewn in place. Don't try to take them off, please. <laughs> and then show them the answer to the other one. So this is one that Sloan had a little difficulty padding out because it was worn later in Mrs. Underwood's life, and so the mannequin needed to, to age a bit to make it look good on her. Now let's come back down and look at the shoes. Careful, here you go. And I'm going to turn it so you can also see the heel. And the interior has the name from Rome. Oh, there. You can see Rome there. And then the red shoes also have this beautiful embroidery on them. And the heel. And now we're going to wander over and show you the two quilts that are here. You have to pull your cord. It's like you get to have a microphone with wires on it. Okay, hold on. How about you try that? So I give you a little more? Okay, that's good enough. You're gonna probably have to come up to see some of these, but you can you can see that all of these little dots have towns on them. And all those little circles, can you just hold still? All of the circles were red at one point because they've been applicated on with red thread. So it's just red that's been fugitive and faded. And I hope you'll come up and look more carefully at this later. And then show them the four point quilt here. This one is such a striking quilt and it's in a pattern I really didn't know. 
until this one came into us. So you've had a chance to see that before we actually get to talk about it. And then Scott, would you go back? <coughs> so there are a few more pictures of Mrs. Underwood just to show you. As you can see, the family gave us lots of pictures to show. She was a very family-oriented woman. This is the family um, Christmas in 1989. Harris is still in that, oh, I'm sorry, there it is. That one's in 89. Harris is still with them. Here she is um, with David Henry on the left, with her, his mother Jane on the right in that picture, and then um, I think with Gwen's family and her, I think it's four generations there in Gwen's family. And then she was not above dressing up. Um, here she is, the evil queen with her four daughters as the dwarfs, um, going to a, uh, an event at Luca. And here she is with the four daughters traveling um, in, at the Biltmore in 2011. She was about improving her community, which is why this exhibit is happening. Here she's planting a tree at Tech in 1980, when the family donated 100 trees to Texas Tech University. And then here she is still at the end of her life, um, protesting about the, um, about the the Gondbold Museum, uh, the Gondbold Building, and the posting is actually her grandsons, um, who posted, I think, on Twitter. Um, our badass grandma is nineteen. Is our badass grandmother is ninety five and still fighting for what she loves every single day? We have one unbelievable woman to look up to in so many ways. <coughs> I didn't post that. He did. I'm just quoting. Him. Here she is at a kite festival um, here at the museum in 1986. It was a major kite day, a kite festival that happened for three years in this community. Here she is breaking ground. Here she is talking with people about some of the plans that she had for Lubbock and how she could achieve them. She went to lots of meetings around the state. How did you do this here? How did you do this building here? How did you do preservation in your community so that then she could bring it back to Lubbock? Here she is at a Luca party with um, their executive director at the time, Karen Wiley, who worked with me in Dallas at the Kennedy assassination site before she came out here and I came out here. Here she is promoting the ballet Folklorium. And she got around in that wheelchair in many, many ways. Here she is with then Governor Rick Perry. At this picture in 2002, she was receiving the Dynamic Force Award from the Arts, Cultural, and Entertainment Committee. Here she is at the Texas Women's Hall of Fame in 2008. Here she is on the cover of Lubbock Magazine. And I think this is from her funeral, her memorial service. Louise broke ground all her life, from the left to the right there. Just sort of a fun remembrance of a woman who made our community better. So I've shown you a little bit about the Lubbock District Quilt. It came from a collector without any information about what it was. And we, you know, we were so all thinking that it says Lubbock District on it, it's red work. Pat Grapp said, you know, it probably dates from the 30s because many of the towns on that quilt weren't settled until the 20s, like Level Land, for instance, which she certainly would know about. And um, you can see, I think in this image very clearly, Crosbyton Senior, Junior, that's why we were thinking it was high schools. Well, here are the articles that talk about it. Um, 500 are expected assembly. Well, it's from June 1930, the Canyon News, and it talks about how people were expected to attend the annual Summer Epsworth League Assembly for the Northwest Texas Conference to be held at West Texas State Teachers College in Canyon from Tuesday to Friday, inclusive. And um, from Lubbock was Reverend Bickley and his wife. They're come, they were leaving on Monday to go to the assembly. And then here's an article from June 5th that talks about the quilt, actually. The beautiful quilt of the Lubbock District, this is better, easier to see it. The beautiful quilt of the Lubbock District is no doubt the t um, some of the most original exhibits on display in the auditorium. Apparently, all of the different districts had exhibits. And um, this quilt has a background of white trimmed in red, so those, it was a red border, which I guess was fugitive as well, unfortunately, the fabric. It represents a map of the Lubbock district with the various places where there is an active league, so an active Epsworth League, um, 
Am I saying that right? It's Epworth League, like League, I believe. It's now called the Youth Fellowship of the, of the Methodist Church. Mm -hmm. Each one of those active League members groups is shown by a red dot. The red work map represents each location within the Lubbock district with an active chapter of the Epworth League, which was broken into age groups such as junior and senior high. Today it's known as United Methodist Youth Fellowship. So kind of fun to find that out. This four points quilt, which is on the stage and also the other one on the stage, were both made by Alma Greer Morris, Mrs. Charles Thomas Morris, who was born in 1894 and died in, 18, in 1985. She lived in De Leon, Comanche County, and um, this came to us. Woman said, I have these quilts, they're really dirty, but they have labels on them. Well, we can do a thing to either one of these quilts, and they're beautiful, they're really not dirty at all. But look at the labels that someone took the time to put on. This is, I mean, it was like, as soon as she said she had labels, we were all over, please let us see these quilts. And we brought in four or five from this collection. The one on the, um, the one here on the stage um, is a design by Ruby McCam, who was a major designer of quilts and quilt patterns. And we've talked about Ruby quite extensively. In fact, we showed this piece, this top that was designed by Ruby and made in Tulia, which was one of the uh, Ruby's designs were in, in the newspapers. This was in the Tulia Herald. And that's probably how Mrs. Morris also got her pattern for the same quilt here um, that you see. She crayoned the blocks, as did the person who made the state bird and flower quilt to your left. The state bird and flower quilt was made by, um, oh, where is it? I'm so sorry, it was made by Jewel D. Merriman Clark, who was born um, in 1914 in Callahan County, Texas and died in June um, of 2003 in Midland. And here in this picture is Jewel with her husband. And this is the state bird quilt. Well, there are lots of state bird quilts out there. So how do we figure out where the source is, what the pattern source is? Well, fortunately, um, this wonderful woman, Rose Marie Winner, has put out a lovely book that helps us identify this. And um, so our quilt has a large banner for the name of the state, and in addition to being just the bird, it's also a, um, it also has the state flowers. And here's the pattern from Aunt Martha. You can still get them today. And um, ours clearly was made before, um, before Hawaii and Alaska were added. So it's 48 states. But also interestingly enough, the pattern that she used for our quilt um, is different than the patterns that she used for the, the one with the 50 states. Excuse me, for instance, Minnesota, the state bird on here is um, not the same state bird as you'll find in the Martha, Aunt Martha's patterns for the 50 states because in 1961, Minnesota decided to make the loon their official state bird. Prior to that, the women's clubs of Minnesota had the goldfinch as their state bird, and that's how Aunt Martha's, that was the bird Aunt Martha's chosen, that's what's going on here. The Texas one is on the bottom row, second from the left, in case you're looking. It looked a little hard to see at first, but I think that's where the Texas one is. And so it's kind of fun, when, I, when we brought this in, I was like, oh, a state bird, well, great, we don't really have this pattern. But then when I was reading Rosemary's book, I was like, oh, those are actually state flowers that go with it. I don't know how I missed that, but so it is both the state bird and the state flower on them. So then the last thing I wanted to show you today was that in fashion, there's a lot of quilts that we see that are just out there and used as patterns. You recognize some of these patterns in these clothes. And I'm going to show you a lot of them in the next few minutes. Quilts really are in fashion for purses, skirts. Don't you love the tumbling blocks on the swimsuit? <laughs> tumbling blocks is my favorite pattern. It's one of the hardest to make. So I've only made one of them, but <laughs> gee, I could have it on a swimsuit instead. <laughs> Maybe not in that size though. Um, I think that's, is that snail's trail on the right? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, now this one has, I think, cool patterns half square triangles in the design. 
And these are all from the pages of Vogue magazine in recent years. On the left is sort of a variation of Grandmother's Flower Garden, but certainly the hexagons. Sort of a crazy patch on the left, and uh, 25 blocks, 25 patch on the right. And also then used in advertising as props. Don't you want to scream that that red and white is on the floor in a barn? <laughs> or are you thinking? This is a Dior ad, and you can see the crazy quilt skirts. They call it the patch game in the magazine. I love the pinwheel on the left, the crazy quilt skirt on the right. Okay, so aren't these fun Dior boots on the left? Only $3,500. I'm sorry, $3,590. And then the Chanel bag on the right. And $850 grandmother's flower garden gloves on the, on the left. Kind of fun, huh? Kind of fun. And Linda's sitting there going, now, which quilts can I cut up? <laughs> Ralph Lauren has the crazy quilt style on the top and the American flag on the bottom. Um, then the log cabin on the left, crazy quilts on the right, patchwork. I sort of thought the Fendi looked like a, a lone star. And then again, the um, tumbling, tumbling blocks. And then of course, um, crochet has sort of found its way into high fashion as well. And look at that, we are on time. Life is good, I could have gone slower. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about the Miss America exhibit. This is what the cover of the book is going to look like. Um, and the book is going to be over 300 pictures, about as big as the, as the needlework book that has come out. And in the exhibit, I have the names of people that will be appearing. Um, I have to tell you about Mary Ann Mobley's dress. You'll just love this story, I hope. Um, it's coming from Mississippi. And you can imagine in 1959, it was a big coop dress. Most objects, when they come to us, come laying flat in, a, in a, an acid-free textile storage box, pretty big, pretty wide, we can lay it flat. We might put some tissue in to stuff it out so it doesn't crease, but that's typically how it comes. Well, the people in Mississippi said, well, for her dress, uh, oh, please don't judge us, but we're gonna send it in a refrigerator box because that's all it fits in. <laughs> So I think that would be fun. Uh, oh, I didn't include on here, um, when I did this slide, I didn't know that, that um, Shirley Cawthorn stuff is coming in. We do have some things from Phyllis George, not her um, competition garments, but things that were at Kent State that she donated. Jane J. Rowe, who is from Oklahoma, some of you might remember her. Um, she did come to the Texas OU game, if any of you were there in the 60s. Some of you are about that age, I think. As Miss America, she came. She was roundly booed by the Texas fans, of course, at the orange end of the stadium, as one would expect, unfortunately. Um, but she's given everything that she had, except her crown, to the Oklahoma History Center. And I had a lovely conversation with her on the phone about each thing, because when the Oklahoma History Center took it in, it was recorded as pink lace dress. Not pink lace dress, designed for her by blah, blah, I can't remember who, but which appeared on the back cover of the Miss America pageant book the year that she was Miss America. It was of Everglades fabric. It was part of the sponsorship. You know, so by talking with me, I've sent Oklahoma a very long list of, this is exactly what this was. And also, I think her combat boots are coming from her time as a USO entertainer in, in Vietnam. One of the things she said to us was they issued, um, they issued us fatigues to wear as we went from camp to camp. But the men really hated it if we came on stage in our fatigues. They wanted us in our pretty dresses, which you could imagine why they, they wanted that. It just showed more leg, I'm sure, to begin with, but it was colorful and pretty. That exhibit will open on December 22nd. It will be open one day before we close for Christmas break, winter break, and then it will reopen on January 4th and go until June 22nd. And there will be an exhibition catalog with it. One of the other things that's happening in February is that these are some of the pieces that Linda has made that did not come into the collection that will be for sale as part of the auction. 
Now, one thing I want to mention to you about this auction is it's none of the objects that came into the museum. We are not selling the museum's collection. We have 73 that she made, which is a really big group to have from one person. The other thing about this auction is that I made the decision about what was going to the auction and what was coming into the collection. So it would be a conflict of interest if I were to bid for any of the quilts. So if you're in the room that night and you go, Dr. Montgomery's not bidding, that's why, because it would be considered a conflict of interest because I decided which pile the, the quilt went into. Does that make sense to you? So please keep that in mind, and I hope you'll keep. We do have some small pieces in the in the um, auction, such as this fun piece of bubbles, which I think is kind of fun. So um, just to remind you, there should be two more come and sees. The one in January will be Miss America, and there will be no quilts. I'm sorry, there will be no quilts, no embroidery. It'll be all images of garments, dresses, the Miss Americas, things that couldn't go into the book. You know, when you do a book like the Miss America fashion book, you have to pay to use images. And some people were very generous and let us have them for free. Some were reasonable, like Vogue, they charged us $150 a picture. Um, some were outrageous and charged us $500 a picture. So we had a budget and not everything could fit us, but I can show everything. Um, in one room at one time, not printing it. And so that's what you'll get to see. And so these are the other dates and you will get reminders. And then, as you know, I kind of like to end, come and see with one fun picture. And so this is for Sloan and others. She was terrified of what I was gonna show. This is Carl Lagerfeld's office at Chanel when he was head designer. My desk is not this bad, thanks to Sloan, but it could be. <laughs> and my desk does not have a cat on it, so be thankful. <laughs> you know, it could be a lot worse. So we have a few minutes if anybody had any questions. I know I rushed through a bit of this. Any questions? Yes, Jackie. Uh, when would Oh, thank you for asking that question. Um, Underwood goes on exhibit on, not in, in the very near future, October 24th. So not this Sunday, but next Sunday. Uh, and Andy has been painting the gallery, it's just about painted. And in case you don't know where the gallery is, when you come in the main door, you go to the right where the boot exhibit currently is, where the boot exhibit is where Miss America will be come December. You go through the boot exhibit to the right of the dinosaur, round back. The um, gallery is the one next to the Davies Gallery in the back. Does that make sense? The, the, the guards will show you. We call it Gallery 5, but we don't have signs on any of those, you wouldn't know that. Thanks for asking. What other questions? Thank you for coming. Thank you for wearing a mask and being careful with each other. 